daring. You're right. Resourceful. And sometimes even sweet. But capturing lions in the raw requires creativity and a willingness to play by their rules. Out here, every extraordinary image must be earned, and the predators call the shots. This is the Serengeti as most of us know it. A place of plenty. Lush grasses. Huge herds. Lots of prey. A perfect place for a predator. But on the park's eastern edge lies a rougher world. Here, prey is scarce. Water, even scarcer. Yet somehow, a lion pride has found a way to make a living in this desolate place. They're called the Vumbi, Swahili for dust. And renowned photographer Michael Nichols is here to tell their story for National Geographic. People call me Nick. I've been a photographer at National Geographic about 30 years, focusing on wildlife conservation. My goal is to make us celebrate what wild is left and go after fixing what we can. Nick strives for images that change people's perceptions of the animals they think they know. Joining him on assignment is cinematographer Nathan Williamson. National Geographic asked us to cover lions in the Serengeti. And for something like that, which has been done many times before, you want to show people something new. Nick and Nathan are trying to combine stills and video to capture the lives of lions on the edge. They picked this pride to show how difficult and fragile lion life can be. Lion numbers are lower than they've ever been. Fragmentation's happening with the human population exploding all over Africa. And we, we were trying to figure out a, a way to tell the world about it in a substantial way. We were looking for a situation that would have a scarcity and so therefore, there would be an element of drama in what's going on with the animal. They've teamed up with the Serengeti Lion Project, which has studied big cats here since the 1960s. The researchers pointed them straight to the Vumbi. The lions have been studied for decades by the project, and we wanted to profile those lions because their existence was so tenuous and their circumstances were so challenging. We came directly to this remote corner of the park where we wanted to focus on the lions, and it was like a dusty moonscape. It was really austere, and it was hard to imagine that anything could really make it there. And then we found this group of mangy, desperate lions that were out in just the absolute middle of nowhere. They live completely on the edge. Once I met that pride, and it happened the first minutes I met them, I couldn't blink from them. Nick and Nathan arrive in the dry season, when conditions are at their worst. No water, no green grass, no prey in sight. 
Vumbi Pride had five females and when we first arrived, nine cubs. And they were eking out an existence in this barren, dry, dusty landscape. The cubs were pathetic. They were desperate. They were covered with manes. You could see their bones. They were fighting over any little bit of milk that they could nurse. With little prey in this part of the Serengeti, the pride must take advantage of every opportunity. The researchers put a radio collar on one female of every pride so that they can track their location for their science. So we were there observing them, watching what was going on, and the collared female stood up and started peering off in the distance, and we had no idea what they might be looking at. Nick and Nathan see nothing. The landscape looks unbroken. showed up there, the collared female and some of the other big females were pawing at this dusty, rocky dust. And it really seemed like the collared female was leading up the operation. She was really, really intent on whatever was in that hole. It's a warthog. Just the fact that they would go in that hole and pull this thing out is incredible because you realize that they were willing to take that risk because they were desperate. The other side of it was the collared female who we saw had some gravitas, she seemed to be kind of a leader. But when they got the warthog, she didn't even take a bite. She stayed on the hole because she knew there was another one in there. That just completely blew us away. You know, she knew there was another warthog in there and she was willing to not eat the first one to take care of the pride. Darkness falls. Eventually, her persistence pays off. You know, I go home that night thinking, what a project we're on. And the beautiful thing for me out of those images, you wouldn't know what happened if you didn't see the video. But the still is what stops it for you, and you can look and examine it and see what everybody's up to. The collared female had a lot to do with the cohesion in the group. That was sacrifice you wouldn't expect from an, a wild animal. That was the thing that I, I would say more than anything else made us fall in love with that pride, because we respected so much what they were doing. Even if you can find food, you, you need water to survive. And so as great a hunter as the collared female was, the lion still needed water. And we were all desperately waiting for the rains. When you come up with the lions and it's the dry time, they don't have water or food or cover. They got nothing. They're like living in a, in a moonscape or a desert. In the dry season, storms can roll in quickly, but they don't last long. 
Once it started raining, the lions started to lick each other, and we were just wondering, like, what's going on? Are they grooming? Uh, is this some kind of ceremony? Eventually, we realized that they were actually licking water off each other's backs in order to drink, that the rains were so short and were so small that there wouldn't be pools of water for them to drink out of. It was crazy to watch because you're just thinking, it's just unimaginable, I guess, that, you would, that you'd have to carve out an existence in a landscape that would be so harsh that, that, that water wouldn't even last on the ground and you'd have to drink off each other's backs. The rain is a lucky but temporary reprieve. and greater challenges still lie ahead for the Vumbi. It's late January. A short rainy season has just ended. After a few months away, Nick and Nathan are heading back to the Pride. Our first trip was basically a chance to get to know the lions. Uh, we shot most of that with camera in hand, just sitting in the vehicle. And there's only so much you can do when you're shooting out of the car. So what we wanted to accomplish on our second trip was to use some of our gear to get really low and really close and get it right in there amongst the lions. If I'm going to do the king of the beast, it's going to be the king of the beast. You know, he can't be the king of the beast that I'm looking down on. Intimacy is everything. If you get your camera down on the ground level, now it's a lion, and it's powerful, and it's big. And so I was obsessed with that. Hold up. All right, Ray, clean your thing. Oh. Oh. We were always trying to find a different perspective. And the assignment before lions was elephants. And one thing that we had experimented there was putting the camera on a pole and putting it on the ground so that you were looking at an elephant from, uh, like, the perspective of a dung beetle. The stick is the way to go. I'm too old to get down on the ground. I can't move fast enough. So we're going with the stick. Here they come. It had worked incredibly well with Elephant. Uh, we had managed to make some images that were really um, kind of jarring, and you would sort of like look at this, and you're like, what, what, what's going on there exactly? <laughs> but these were habituated elephants. Getting the same perspective with wild lions presents an entirely different challenge. The obvious difference is the elephant don't bite. So you have to think about safety. You have to think about the fact that a lion is a big cat. And so the last thing you want to do is make a cat toy. We had this robot constructed for us. It had tank treads, an armored area to hold the cameras. And we built it so that there would be two cameras in it, one for Nick to use to take still pictures with and one for me to use to, to make a film with. Any of this gear, when you get this wish list, if someone says, like, you can have anything, it's like, wow, you know, I'd like that, and I'd like that, and I'd like that, and I'd like that. And all of a sudden, it becomes so complicated that it's just like a house of cards. You know, like, what's going to fail? Well, we'll go check on the den, and then we'll go to the back to the pride. While Nathan works on the robot, Nick and his wife, naturalist Reba Peck, check in on the pride. The recent rains have brought the parched earth back to life. The lions seem to be doing well. As we come back, the cubs are bigger, they're much stronger. They're half the size of their moms. They're fully into meat, but somebody was missing. We went from nine to eight. We were kind of speculating, because you could see how they laid and behaved and, and fed, that you have runts, you have outsiders. And it was one of the outsiders. It's survival of the fittest. But only one death during the dry season is actually a remarkable feat. Across Africa, more than half of all lion cubs die before the age of two. The Vumbi are defying the odds, but their success is a double-edged sword. 
The more hungry cubs that survive, the more pressure on the females to keep them all fed. Back at camp, Nathan finally has the robot working. Now it's time to see how the lions will respond to it. The first few times we used the, the robot with the lions, it, it was a little dicey. Once it became the center of their attention, that was really nerve wracking because we didn't know if they would destroy it. And also, once they're playing with it, obviously you're not filming their behavior or what they're doing. All of a sudden you're filming them playing with you and that's not what we wanted. And she's coming towards you, get ready for her. They would start to gather around it and paw at it. And so there were these like crazy moments where I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if they were going to dismember the thing. Ooh, bingo. Fortunately, the only casualty is a microphone cover. What? I gotta watch lions. And a dirty lens. Right in the sweet spot. Since Nick and Nathan arrived in the Serengeti, they have only seen the females of the Vumbi pride and the cubs. But there are male lions in this part of the park too. The males bring complexity to the pride dynamic and the photographers are getting impatient for their arrival. As a wildlife photographer, you can't direct the animals. You can't just say, if it'd be all right, if you'd bring the males out tomorrow, that'd be swell. So, I mean, it's tough. You know, we're just basically waiting for the males to arrive, and we have no idea when that might happen. For weeks, Nick and Nathan stay with the females. But then one day, everything changes. When we first pulled up there and we saw that there was a male with Fumbi, we were super excited. It was early in the afternoon, and we knew immediately we were going to have to ride this one out and stay as long as possible, because any time when there's a male around the females, something could happen. That's good, that's good. I thought... I might be on to a stranger male because they were acting so cautious. If this male has no affiliation with the pride, he'll try to kill the cubs, to eliminate the offspring of rival males, and to bring their mothers back into heat. But the females will fight the males off if they can. Uh, and a lot of times the females will die trying to protect their cubs. So there would be some epic battle about to happen. I mean, we had no doubt that those five female lions were a force to be reckoned with. They were, I always, I always called them a biker gang. I mean, they were tough. Luckily, this turns out to be Sea Boy, the massive male who fathered several of the Vumbi cubs. But that still doesn't mean he's in for a warm welcome. The first time that we saw Sea Boy with the females, it was tense. It was this uneasy truce that seemed to be established out there where they were tolerating him, but he wasn't allowed very close. And so he was there, but on the periphery.
it seemed like they were unsure what to do with him and not, not trusting him exactly. As the day wears on, the females seem to grow more comfortable with Seaboy. And even the cubs start approaching him. It was a quiet night, it was peaceful, and we were just along for the ride. We're with them, and they're in front of the little water. I'm shooting at the edges of what's possible. And I've got little lights on the car that are visible lights. But I, I feel like something's about to happen. Seaboy kept growling at the cubs that wanted to play with him because the cubs being like, you know, like cubs do, they wanted to play with the big guy, so they kept going up and greeting him or whatever, and he would snap and growl at him. And then just seemingly out of nowhere, the female snap. <laughs> it lasted just a few seconds. And we had to wait until we saw the pictures at the end to even know what happened. It was so quick. Bumby girls, she don't, <laughs> don't mess with Bumby. <laughs> no, don't, mess. don't mess with the Bumby. <laughs> they circled him. I know. <laughs> they circled him. No, I nailed it. You see it? Well, oh, somebody's biting him. Collared females biting him. No. Biting him. <laughs> biting him on the ass. We always knew she was badass. But you know, that goes against, everybody's like, oh no, the male is boss. I mean, we may have landed on the queen of the damn Serengeti, right here. <laughs> Good night. That gave us an image that I thought, at the time, I was like, I didn't think female lions attacked male lions. I thought they ran away. It's a powerful reminder of how viciously the females will protect their cubs. But they don't go so far as to drive Seaboy off completely. Because there are other, less familiar males in the area. And the pride might soon need Seaboy's protection. With the arrival of Seaboy, the Voombi have some much needed protection from other male lions. The females are still vigilant, making sure he doesn't get too rough with the cubs. But they'll put up with his temper because he's a powerful male with a track record of survival. August 2009. Okay, 17th of August 2009. The researchers told us that Seaboy had actually been kicked out of his previous territory by this marauding group of powerful males that go by the name the Killers. One of the researchers named Ingela was out there and had seen Seaboy being torn apart by the Killers and managed to make some incredible photographs of that fight. When I sort of back away from that to know, oh Christ, this is in, in the middle of a great battle here. Three against one, then they come for him. And I'm there, you know, with my lens, I can't adjust it too much. So I'm You're having it on okay. the widest that I can. Oh, they're right next to your car. They're right, it, yeah, it's like between here and my car here. Oh, oh my God. Oh, Must have been so loud. loud. I was sure they were killing him. It was three against one, 
But incredibly, Sea Boys survived the attack, escaped to a new territory, and took over the Vumbi pride. He had, I mean, what a story. You know, he was complete badass. I mean, this male was so tough that he took on three other males. So, you know, it, he was a character for us immediately. Sea Boy brings a level of security that few other males could supply. But on his own, even he will have difficulty preventing a takeover by rival males. The most likely suspects? Sea Boy's old enemies. The killers are back on the prowl. And now, there are four of them to be reckoned with. In order to survive in such a place, you need teamwork. And the females gather together and they form a pride and they look after each other, they have each other's backs and they defend their territory together as a unit. The males have a similar thing where they form coalitions to compete with other males. The killers are just such a coalition. But Nick and Nathan have only seen Seaboy alone or with the pride. We were out in the afternoon, and we found Sea Boy walking towards one of these tall rock outcroppings. Sea Boy had been trying to mate with this female, and it wasn't going well. Sea Boy started roaring, and immediately started walking in the same direction as he'd been roaring. And so, of course, we followed him. Eventually, we saw in the direction he was walking towards, another lion coming towards him. From afar, it's unclear if this is a rogue male, or maybe even one of the killers. But ultimately, it's neither. Turns out, Sea Boy has a coalition partner, too. The researchers have named him Hildor. There's this incredible moment where they do this, like, nuzzle thing, you know, this little dance. To me, it's just like a, an amazing example of a coalition and these two males sort of affirming their bond together. The male lions have to do this. In fact, one male lion is a goner. A coalition of two is not really very strong unless you've got a sea boy. Like Seaboy, Hildor fathered several Vumbi cubs and will fight for their survival. But his arrival puts added pressure on the females of the pride. There are places where male lions absolutely do participate in killing food. But what I saw was the opposite of that. I saw scavengers that, that get fed because they provide protection, kind of like a mafia situation. There's an obvious pecking order. The males can control whatever the pride kills. So the females would kill something, male would take it and eat really until he was full. There really is very little to go around. And with a group that big, with a pride that large, one small gazelle or whatever it is they killed, there's not enough to go around, even for the cubs. 
The cubs were fighting over just the right to lick the blood off the grass because that's all that was left. I didn't think you would actually fight him on the blood, but he did. It's a tough deal. It's a tough. It's it's. It, I think there's no doubt it's difficult for the females to watch the males eat that much, you know, fill themselves up, and then leave whatever is left for the cubs. It's the price the pride must pay for protection. They now have two strong, loyal males to fend off attacks. But with them come two very large stomachs that demand to be fed. When we went into this project, everybody said, ah, oh, man, lions, all they do is lay around and sleep. And it's true, they sleep an awful lot. But there's like a whole another part about being a lion that happens once the sun goes down. They see far better than the prey at night. So if it's perfectly dark, a lion can walk in amongst the prey, and the prey will hardly know they're there. And so we had to find some way to cover that. With five females, eight fast-growing cubs, and two males, the pride needs a lot of fresh meat. Every kill can mean the difference between life and death. So it's crucial not to disturb the lions or take away their advantage. For the lions to have the most success, there could be no light. Even moonlight would mess them up. And so for us, that became massively difficult. Our cameras were unable to see when there was no moon. So we had to project this invisible light that only the cameras could see. Working at night was about as difficult a set of circumstances you can create for yourself. But I thought it was just so important to use invisible light. Sounds simple, great. Project some infrared light. Uh, the lions can't see it, perfect. The reality is it was a real pain. I mean, for me, driving the vehicle became very difficult because I could only see as far as we were able to project the light. Hey, Reba, keep an eye on this one coming in from behind us on the road. I don't know, you're just so disoriented. And you can't see and you're focused and you hit holes and you, you can't really do what you want to do. But by working at night, I felt like we got into their world. There were several instances where we were right on their tail, and they had taken down an animal, and we got there before it was dead. The eyes were still moving. You could tell it was still alive and struggling. I think some of the footage that we have still reads very clearly for what it is, which is a family that's you know surviving on this incredible landscape. We made several frames that were really, really cool. That's about family eating. That's what that's, that picture's translating to, we fed the family tonight.
days between hunts are slow. But just over the horizon, the killers are gearing up for a raid. The males that kicked Seaboy out of his last pride are looking for another one to take over. They're known for killing cubs. Rival males and even adult females that stand in their way. There is no guarantee that Seaboy and Hildor will be able to defend the pride from their onslaught, even if the females join in the defense. With their cubs almost ready to go off on their own, the Vumbi pride is about to face the ultimate challenge to their survival. Wild presents all new premieres in the underwater event of the year. Sharkfest is back. And Wild is the only place to get up close and personal with the ultimate predators of the sea, celebrating the true kings of the ocean. Don't miss Sharkfest. Starts Monday, August 21st at 6 on Natio Wild. They're some of the most beautiful, most powerful, most incredible animals on the planet, and Nat Geo Wild is dedicated to protecting them. The forest is disappearing. It's a sad story, but one that we have to tell. Join us as we venture deep inside the wild places they call home and find out what can be done to save them. Mission Critical, new episodes every month on Nat Geo Wild. It's the middle of the night, and the killers are on the move. The team is tracking them into Vumbi territory and bracing for a showdown. But long before any contact is made, the lions square off with their roars. There's this incredible communication that goes on, particularly at night. We're with Vumbi, and we hear roars in the distance, and Vumbi perks up, and then they roar back. They know these sounds so well, and they absolutely communicate with each other using their roars. One of the amazing things that the researchers have found is that the lions absolutely can count, and they use their roars to decide whether or not to attack or not to attack another group of lions. Researchers have recorded the roars and played them back to the lions to see how they react. So they have found by playing, for example, two roars to a group of lions that say number five, if they play two roars and there's five lions listening, those five will almost always come towards the two ready to attack. And yet if they play, say, 10 roars and the other group is five, the other group will often go away. With the killers, the numbers are a little more even four of them versus Seaboy, Hildor, and five females. Only time will tell if the killers like those odds. Did you look over this way, Nick? But the night doesn't go as expected. As the killers approach, a lone female crosses their path. Killers are distracted. One heads off after the female. And 
and the others suddenly seem less focused. Interestingly enough, when the killers did invade, they didn't even go after Vombi. By morning, the killers have gone right through the Vumbi's territory and into the next. Perhaps the female threw them off their game. Or perhaps they decided a place with such scrubby ground and a lack of big herds wasn't worth fighting for. It's not, not worth it. I'm not going to take on Seaboy for that. For now, the threat to the Vumbi has passed, and life is about to get a whole lot better. Rain, in, in all my world out there, rain is a, something I savor. Can I turn toward him a little, turn toward him a little? For us, it makes it difficult. You're, you're, you're getting the water off your lens as much as you're shooting, and water's pull, in the car, like water's coming in every opening. But rain meant sunshine in the lion's life. They're, they're really on the edge, and the rains came, and then the prey picks up, and it's life is all of a sudden pretty easy. Once the rains came and the landscape became populated with wildebeest, that's when we needed some way to show that. And so we had this new bit of technology, this small helicopter, that we were able to deploy and take our cameras just 20, 30 meters above the ground. And just by doing that, just by getting up that, just that little a bit, we were able to show this totally new vantage point of the wide open flat expanse that is Vumbi's territory and how the wildebeest were coming and grouping amongst the little stream beds. For the Vumbi, it's the season of plenty. More water than they can drink. Wildebeest by the thousands. The cubs have survived their first dangerous dry seasons and are just about ready to strike out on their own. They're a far cry from where they were when the expedition began. When we first encountered Vumbi, the cubs were obviously vulnerable. Like, they were barely hanging on. They were small, they were bony, they were mangy their fate was hardly decided. And when we left them, they were almost two years old. They were nearly as big as their mothers. They were tough, they were strong. They were completely different. And there's no doubt that these cubs had only made it as far as they had because their mothers were such incredibly competent and doting mothers. The Vumbi have succeeded in raising their cubs from infancy to near adulthood, a process the photographers have managed to cover from just about every angle. And I believe in history. I, I really believe the whole point of doing what I do is that you record it and you lock it down and you save it and it represents that moment in, our, in the world. And it may have some effect. You do want people to care for, to walk away and to actually care for those animals, to feel like they're worthy of saving, worthy of keeping, because certainly their existence in the world is fragile. This project wasn't about the Vumbi Pride. It became, they stole our hearts and they showed us these lions on the edge. 